Hey guys, what's up? Argo. After a tangent of videos about Hexen Zirkle and Fontaine, we can finally talk about this floating rock again. So, welcome to another video about Sinners. Now, I highly suggest you watch the previous Sinner video first since it's kind of a primer for this one. You can still watch this video if you want to, it's fine. But the first one helps you guys marinate for the crazy that I'm preparing to serve. Timestamps below, let's see how far I can tempt you guys to jump down this rabbit hole. We already have multiple instances of sins and calming voices or madness that corrupts Tevat. Karmic depth that is the evil howls of fallen gods which eats away at every living being, human, elemental, or god. Unknown Archon essence that causes both dark powers and joining whispers of vengeance and murder. Malformed beasts that stain its enemies with a deep sin causing mania and insanity. A dark will that consumed a kitsune and spread corrupted memories. Corruption that the so-called gods cleanse in fear that it may one day again spread a veil of sin and maybe knowledge of the cosmos that sages can't help but try to reach a lost civilization where sins are piled up high and its ghosts are now called sins even erosion that erases memory yet leaves emotions to fester all of these to me come from one single place commanded by one single thing the one who to me committed the only act that is worthy of being called a sin that is to introduce the abyss to the world in a time we don't know about bear in mind the abyss did come from Conria, the abyss came from the abyss. An element that might exist for longer than we think, longer than any archon who lived, and maybe even longer than any elemental being, in a time that time itself can't even fathom. Let's start with the Gnostic Serpent, since this is where we last ended. The Gnostic Serpent is seen as a dark serpent in possession of something called the Genesis Pearl. And this pearl is meant to be retrieved by heirs of the Kingdom of Light. One fell to its deception, and one had to start another journey. The Serpent to me is the sinner, and is the one responsible for introducing the Abyss to the world. Now, I'm gonna have to take you guys back to Dragon Spine really quickly. A kingdom of which was destroyed by a Celestial Nail. Props to Infinity A for commenting on this theory by the way. Now, in one of the rooms, we can see see a similar event of a king pointing somewhere and two beings coming to quite a large entity. This entity had horns facing backwards and was holding up a sort of shining sphere. The sphere could be the Genesis Pearl that the Gnostic Serpent is keeping. The two could be the heirs that the king sent out which many theories propose as the twins. The mountain and the Gnostic Chorus could be Dragonspine but another thing I want you guys to look at which I have been very interested in is the horn-like protrusions on its head. Where have we seen horns protruding from the head. Oh that's right Haley Churls, human-like creatures that existed for thousands of years even longer than Conria? Yeah, these guys could have existed along with Salvin Dagner and maybe even along with the Dragon Lords. But that's beside the topic. Another group of creatures that have horns are the Abyss Heralds and Lectors, which are the same entities that we see from the Abyss Order. It could also mean that Conria and the Abyss Order unspokenly worship not a god, but something that belongs to the Abyss. Something that is the Abyss, but isn't our sibling. And it doesn't help that the Heralds and Lectors drop these statuettes. One of which seems to be unsettlingly twisted from its original form, one that emanates an ominous energy and whispers of a pitch dark void that will one day consume everything and destroy the throne of the heavens. Now, I know the same items drop from the Black Serpent Knights, but for some reason we call these things Black Serpent Knights and nobody asks why. This is weird considering the only relation we have of the Abyss in the Gnostic Chorus is a Serpent of Darkness. For some reason these Knights' only dialogues speak of a Dark One's curse as well as speaking of shattering so-called illusions and cleansing the sky with sacred blood, akin to Flower of Paradise Lost. But this also links the Gnostic Serpent with the Sinner, since we've been revealed to how easily the Sinner can deceive people and could explain why our sibling for some reason thinks that they are from Conria and calling themselves the prince or princess of darkness, which again leads to the Gnostic Chorus. Serpents and sins aren't exclusive to Conria and the Gnostic Chorus either. Remember Enkanomia? I sure as heck don't want to. Enkanomia was a unified civilization that existed under the rule of the Primordial One. Assumptions say that his name was Fanes but nobody really confirms. Now, the story goes that the Primordial One beat the Dragon Lords and created the world using the shell of the egg of which the Primordial One was born from. Cosmic Egg, Phanes, and the Cosmic Snake. There's even a place in Enkanomiya called the Heart of Ouroboros, a name from before the Orobashi even came. Something interesting about Enkanomiya and the Primordial One was a taboo that no one must commit, that is, to succumb to temptation. But the path to temptation was already sealed. Now, 
what's another word for giving into temptation? That's right, sin. Yaku Yakuku is dubbed as the netherworld of sinners where sins piled high, along with sin shades and emotions called sins of Tokoyo. Even the Blood Branch rites includes four counts of profanity and eight counts of deceiving living souls. Weirdly enough, at that time, there were four shades of the primordial one and four sins of profanity. And Joe also calls himself a sinner who committed deception and betrayal. Now back to the cosmic egg. Having that egg of creation, that Genesis pearl, which could create entire worlds, you could maybe have the power to control worlds as well. To have something that even gods have little power over, as mentioned by the mysterious voice. But here's the problem. The abyss controls the world. Why would the abyss be the one that controls fate and the world? Shouldn't it be the light kingdom and by extension Celestia that weaves fate? If the primordial one created the world with the cosmic egg, then shouldn't it be able to control the world? I find it weird as well that the Serpent of Darkness in the Gnostic Chorus is in possession of something so prevalent as a Genesis Pearl, something speculated as the Cosmic Egg as well, unless that Pearl isn't supposed to be with the Serpent in the first place. The second one… oh boy, the second one. The second one who came might be the sinner who stole and now possesses the Cosmic Egg, and is the main catalyst that allows the Abyss to control fate, as well as being the sole reason that Celestia is now dormant. The power that the sinner holds and the sin of humanity that they ever so want to achieve is to change fate, as mentioned by Mona's astrology. Astrology reveals the truth unreservedly, but not everyone is willing to accept their fate. Not only that, it is also prominent to Albedo, a creation of gold. As beings who set foot in this world, how arrogant are we in desiring to control our destiny and in desiring to create? Is creation an arrogant act, Traveler? If not, why do we call the ones that created us and control us gods? If it is, then what qualifies us to call ourselves creators? How far must we take our reverence and respect, and what purpose does it serve? Finally, more terrifyingly, now we can even see it in the Sustainer of Heavenly Principles. Who are you? The Sustainer of Heavenly Principles. The Arrogation of Mankind ends now. The Arrogation of Mankind. Seizing something that is not theirs. Sin or succumbing to temptation might have already been committed probably even before Enkonomiya was created. Dare I say, humanity's fate was already decided from the start because humanity hungers to control their destiny and have their own creations. Finding a way to change one's fate is every person's dream, even by a little. But every time humanity tries, they are always punished and cursed. Weirdly enough, the Seelie Kingdom where the Goddess of Flowers comes from was exiled after one of these instances of invasion and punishment. Now, whether or not Seelie falling in love with a human was the same cause of the emergence of invaders, which is different from their punishment of exile, we can't say. But again, humanity is involved in yet another catastrophe. The Goddess of Flowers is also characterized with horns, similar to the horned entity in Dragonspine. And Dragonspine is closely tied in with lore and theories of Seelies as well. Divine Envoys was also present in the Goddess of Flowers' story, and a similar story seems to be implied in Dragonspine as well. This does make you wonder though, do Seelies also have horns, or is the Goddess of Flowers something else? Maybe a moon sister, perhaps? Which by the way, the Seelies are closely tied with. Seelies actually have horns by the way. It's also weird that abyss creatures, hilly churls, and Conria statuettes follow the same look, as if it was created in the likeness of some god entity. Divine envoys are also present in the Seelie Kingdom as well, but could also be present in Byako Yakoku before their fall. Implied by Enjo, they didn't interfere much in that time, but that also means that they already existed in that time, interestingly along with the four shades, one of which disappeared, leaving three shades. And now we have stories of three Moon Sisters and the Fall of the Seelie Kingdom, which are the only other divine entities that isn't the primordial one. So maybe the second one was a Seelie, or a Moon Sister, or a Shade, Easteroth, that maybe 
tried to help humanity rebel against the primordial one. The same rebellion that Snaznaya is trying for and that King Destret already tried. And weirdly enough, was already foreseen by the Goddess of Flowers, which is also theorized to be a moon sister. The Goddess of Flowers foresaw a rebellion that highlights the future of humanity and rising against divine will. Let's not forget to mention that the Goddess of Flowers gave King Deshret a so-called higher knowledge, but what came with it was punishment and loss. All of these are similar instances. Deshret, Conria, and maybe even Enkanomia and Salvin. But all of them ended in the same way. Divine nails out of fear to cleanse and mend the land. Tangent. I think we all know that the Abyss isn't from Tevat, but it's not from Kanria either. The multitude of Abyss creatures that we fight are not from this world. The Great Sinner Gold created endless monsters with dark alien blood. Mutated life forms caused by powers not of this world. The Fortune Lector is the only Abyss creature that looks like an Abyss Herald, but isn't part of the Abyss Order. Now, what if the Abyss Order isn't just composed of the cursed people of Conria? What if there are humanoid beings that call the Abyss their home? One of our Lector friends, Enjo, states that he is a creature writhing in the Abyss, instead of a cursed human from Conria. Every Lector and Herald we meet not only uses elemental and Abyss magic, their attack sequences also include stars and space, and now from the Iniquitous Baptist, galaxies. Something that is very specific to Abyss-related attacks. Even Mona's hydromancy and astrology for some reason has the stars and maybe the Abyss. There's also Child who learned his Abyss powers from Skirk, someone from the Abyss. Lastly, Danesniff who uses some form of Abyss ability or specifically called Corruption that is familiar to the Heralds. I sense your soul is stained by terrible bloodshed, perhaps from your darkest nightmares, unless... <clears throat> oh, and something far more dangerous. You reek of a corruption familiar to me. Then we are the same. We're both dangerous. But dangers from outside of the Abyss Order must be caught and caged. Conria isn't the only one who dwells in the Abyss, and we were possibly told that since 1.1. End of tangent. Now, let's go back to humanity for a bit. Remember Piero? Yeah, well, he was a mage in Conria. In that time, Conria had more than one mage or, well, sage. And quite a lot of these sages, whoever they are, apparently persuaded the ruler of a previous kingdom. And this kingdom tore the veil of sin and ushered a tide of wrath and destruction. Again, humanity, sin, and punishment. Now, this sage who had the ruler's favor could be the same sage in the silver twig, a sage hanging themselves from a tree and gaining knowledge of runes and sacred words, and a kingdom on a tree's roots gaining a glimpse of the cosmos, knowledge of the stars, mysteries of the stars and the abyss. This is the same thing as the goddess of flowers warned King Deshret as well, and what Piero is planning is the same thing Deshret did, a rebellion, a grand feast, so to speak. Humanity, ambition, and rebellion also can be implied from Dainsleaf in Travail, which came out even before the game released. In the perpetual meantime of a sheltered eternity, most are content to live and not to dream. But in the hidden corners where the gods' gaze does not fall, there are those who dream of dreaming. Some say a few are chosen and the rest are dregs. But I say we humans have our humanity. We will defy this world with a power from beyond. So, are you content to live and not dream? Or are you someone who dreams of dreaming for the sake of humanity? To defy the world with a power from beyond and would go to great lengths of temptation and sin for your own ambitions.
And there it is, who is the sinner and humanity's ultimate fate, I guess. I know there's gonna be holes in that theory somewhere for sure, and I can't fill it with official lore, but theories will be theories, and I think I made the idea of humanity's sin, as well as the abyss's intentions, clear enough. If you enjoyed that video and watched all the way to the end, do give a like and subscribe, hit the bell for more content, and comment your thoughts on how dumb or crazy this theory is, because I certainly think it is. This theory is either hanging on the edge or is already falling down the hole. But hey, can't blame me for dreaming, right? Anyways, that's it for the sinner for now. Until later updates. But I'll see you guys in the next video, yeah? Like, comment if you enjoyed, subscribe for more ramblings, and stay mad theorists. Bye!